Walking into this building um, earlier this afternoon, I had a sense of deja vu, and I realised that the last time I was in this building was when I sat my BA finals at the University of London exactly 50 years ago. So that's a little bit of personal archaeology uh, for you. Um, but I just thought I would share that little anecdote with you. Um, yeah, this is a joint presentation, and I want to absolutely stress uh, three co-authors and their fundamental contribution to uh, this paper, uh, because they did most of the uh, interviews. Uh, and my role has essentially been to try to coordinate this comparative uh, study, because uh, I think that comparing a uh, country's experience of migration is really interesting and really fruitful. Um, and of course, the three Baltic states make a, a unique trio for this, uh, for this comparison. Uh, I'm also kind of badging or branding this presentation as a kind of pilot study for a, a larger project called Youth Mobility, which is, uh, I think as Dutch just said, a Horizon 2020 project, which has only been going for a year or so. We're in the data collection stage and uh, Latvia is one of our partner countries along with uh, many other countries uh, within the European Union and essentially it studies the interaction between um, spatial mobility, international mobility uh, in the form of intra-EU migration and social mobility and youth transitions, transitions from education to employment, from one kind of employment to another, from youth to, if you like, full adulthood uh, and so on. So that's just a little bit of the background to this uh, this particular paper and the way in which it relates to a much larger project. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to concentrate, of course, mainly on findings, uh, but before that, uh, a series of kind of preliminary uh, contextual uh, slides uh, about uh, the context which I've just described. I want to specify what the uh, specific research questions are. Uh, a few words about some of the conceptual frameworks that we're trying to bring to bear uh, on this empirical data. Uh, a few more background statistics in addition to the ones that we've heard already uh, on the Baltic countries' experience of migration and also economic trends. Uh, research design and methods, just one slide, and then I'll work through the findings, which will be a series of slides kind of nominating key points with some selected quotes, uh, typical quotes from the, uh, the interview uh, narratives. Um, so the context is this general rise that we observe, and also statistically through uh, Eurostat data and other sources, of uh, young adult graduate migration within Europe, uh, and the increasingly dominant role of London uh, as a key destination for this uh, intra-European mobility. Um, we can trace the origins perhaps back to the 1990s in terms of the movement of uh, considerable numbers of French and German uh, and uh, Italian graduates and from other sort of old EU countries, the EU 15 countries. Uh, but then, of course, when uh, the Eastern enlargement came in uh, in 2004 and 2007, uh, then the Eastern flow uh, also became extremely important, uh, and that was exacerbated, uh, as it was from other parts of peripheral Europe, like Ireland and Southern Europe, with the 2008 uh, crisis. Uh, but within this kind of changing map of intra-European migration and the increasing role of graduate level uh, migrants within this uh, overall total, uh, it seemed to us that the role of the three Baltic states tends to be overlooked. You know, there's a lot of studies which you can read in the migration literature about young Italians and young Spanish uh, people, uh, for example, and, and, and Greeks and Irish uh, and Poles uh, in, uh, in, in, in the UK and, and other kind of core EU countries, but the, the Baltic states t tend to be uh, I think overlooked. These are our three key research questions, each of which kind of correspond to a stage in the migration process. So what are the main motivations of young graduates from these three countries to migrate to London? How do they describe and narrate their working lives in London, both their, both their working lives and their non-working lives? And finally, what are, what are the perspectives for uh, the future. Uh, do they intend to stay abroad, return home, or engage in some other kind of uh, maybe onward uh, migration? Okay, I could spend quite a lot of time talking about our conceptual frameworks because this has been kind of one of my main kind of contributions to this project. I mean, both this project and also the wider uh, Y Mobility project. Um, but I'll try and be sort of as brief and synthetic as possible. So, firstly, it's about youth transitions. We are interested in people who are 
uh, young adults between the age of finishing education, which can be sort of 16 or 18 upwards, up until something like mid-30s, let's say. So that's the broad uh, age range. And the kinds of transitions that those people are involved in are, of course, the education to employment transition, uh, which may be a complex transition. I'm very much simplifying what these transitions are. The transition from unemployment in the home country to employment abroad, or the transition from one kind of employment in the home country, casual, precarious, low paid, to another kind of employment abroad, which is more secure uh, and better paid. And all those transitions can be embedded in a wider life transition, which we can call the transition from youth to some notion of full adulthood. By full adulthood, we usually mean something like you know, settling down, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, developing life with a partner, planning a family, uh, establishing a home, uh, and so on. In terms of, let's say, economic geography, um, we mobilize this core periphery model, uh, which is an old model in political economy and development studies, but I think it can be applied uh, to Europe, because if you go back, let's say, to the 1950s and 1960s and look at a map of the migration flows in those days, it was very much migration from the peripheral countries of Europe, particularly the southern periphery, uh, to the core countries. Uh, and we see that map continuing to replay itself in the current migration, the current spatial migration patterns as well. And of course, underlying that simple spatial pattern are all sorts of political economic processes about the nature of capitalist development uh, and so on. Thirdly, uh, we are interested uh, also in looking at this, uh, these migration flows in, in kind of cl combined class and labor market terms. Um, so are these Baltic migrants what Adrian Favell would call Eurostars, kind of high-flying, multilingual, uh, multicultural, uh, 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 high-earning um, pe people working in major European countries, for example, uh, or are they what Conradson and Layson would call more like uh, ordinary and middling transnationalists, which are more like a sort of standard middle class uh, uh, level, let's say, or are they more like working labour migrants uh, suffering, even though they're graduates, from uh, de-skilling uh, and, and forced only to access low status jobs because of the language barrier or because they can't trade on the qualifications because their qualifications are not recognised uh, or whatever. And the final uh, conceptual framework that we try to bring in is the notion of lifestyle migration which traditionally in migration studies has been applied to people who are migrating into rural areas and kind of opting out of the rat race and looking for a quieter lifestyle. Um, but I think that can also be applied to this younger group who are migrating to large urban areas, to large, the large metropolitan area of London, uh, which can also be seen as a search for a particular lifestyle, a metropolitan or cosmopolitan lifestyle, if you, if you will. Okay, here's a few background statistics uh, which simply reinforce those that we have seen before. The top set uh, look at uh, total and youth unemployment and show really neatly how uh, these three countries um, uh, went through uh, the crisis and have partially recovered from the crisis, at least in terms of uh, crude uh, unemployment and, and, and youth unemployment figures. Uh, and then I just pick out the national insurance uh, registration, the NINO registrations for the three countries. And my, da my data are not quite so up to date as, <laughs> as yours are. I'm a year behind you, but you can see that for Latvia it was 150,000 at that stage. And what Olga said about uh, the fact that the NINO registrations are a very imperfect measure of the chronology of migration has to be uh, repeated here as well. Okay, our basic research method is uh, the personal narrative extensive <coughs> interview, the open-ended, largely open-ended, loosely structured interview, uh, and my three colleagues, uh, Maria Saar, uh, interviewed Estonians, uh, Estonians uh, Aya Lule from Latvia interviewed uh, uh, the, La the Latvians, and uh, Violetta Perutis, who I was hoping would be here today, but uh, her, her husband has been taken ill, so unfortunately she's not. Uh, uh, Violetta looked at the uh, the Lithuanians. For the time being, we're treating this, these three countries as one sample. We haven't yet had time to explore what differences there are, if any, uh, between the three samples. So, what I now move into is the, the, the findings part of this presentation, which are organized under each of the three 
uh, research questions, and for each of the first, each of the research questions, I'll try to sort of pick out the key narrative themes that we distilled from the uh, from the interviews, and then a bunch of of, of, uh, of quotes to, to to illustrate each of the or some of the uh, some of the themes. So, research question one was about motives, uh, and of course, no great surprises here, as you would expect. The economic motive uh, was uh, paramount. It was all about uh, increasing income earning capacity, but also career development uh, as well. And we can see London, and we also see this in terms of the internal migration dynamics within the UK as well. London is seen as what my colleague Tony Fielding at Sussex calls an escalator region. It's where you go when you want to escalate or accelerate your career because of the you know, the tremendous opportunities there are in the labour market because of the higher incomes, the greater possibilities for promotion, and so on. And whether you stay on the escalator and stay in London, or whether you step off the escalator and go somewhere else, of course, is the big uh, question for the, for the future. So uh, economics, uh, career development, and also self-realisation. Um, we found that there was a strong narrative theme which was uh, about this notion of going to the UK, and particularly going to London, as the place where one could really test one's limits and, and realise one's potential. Uh, also, the lifestyle factor came in as well as a key motivation, uh, in some cases even overriding the economic uh, motivation, but in most cases alongside uh, the economic motivation. And then, of course, as there always is in migration, there are certain personal factors, uh, people have, um, people feel the need to escape their country, there's some kind of rupture, uh, people fall in love and follow their partners and so on, so these, these uh, personal factors are, are important as well. So uh, here's just some, some quotes, I'm not going to read all the quotes out because that's really boring for you, so I think that you can probably scan these quotes as I just kind of burble on uh, quietly trying to pick out uh, maybe some of the some of the key phrases. So if you look at the first two quotes there, there's the mention of money. So it's all about a higher income, higher wages uh, coming through. The third quote, uh, actually, as I walked in uh, just at the end of the previous section, there was a, a former journalist sitting here who was talking about the, uh, the, limited, uh, the limited scope for journalistic development and journalistic careers in the Baltic states. And actually, here's a, a classic illustration of precisely uh, that point. Uh, where Nika uh, describes uh, how she was working for a, a, a Russian language uh, newspaper in, in Riga, but she says, you know, the ceiling is just too low in Latvia. It's such a small country and so few newspapers. So in order to develop her, um, her, um, uh, her journalistic career, she had to, uh, to, she had to move away. And then some of the, uh, the personal factors uh, in terms of uh, research Question one, this is more about uh, self-realization. So if you look at the middle quote there from uh, the Estonian uh, um, respondent, uh, uh, taking different jobs and challenges is like conquering a new universe. So, and then once I knew it, it was a good feeling, the feeling that you know everything about it and then you want to move on, explore something new uh, again. So uh, these personal and self-realization factors uh, come out as important as well. Research question two was more about the experience of living and working uh, in London. And the key themes that we uh, extracted here uh, were, of course, about the working environment, because these were primarily economically motivated uh, young <coughs> graduates. Uh, and uh, the contrast between uh, the, the work culture uh, in London, here in London, compared to the to the, the home country, the fact that there was more possibility for transparency and openness and a sort of critical engagement with each other in the work environment, um, and uh, um, uh, key, key, yeah, key themes here, as I, I said, are more open, meritocratic, less hierarchical, uh, and the possibility to develop managerial and entrepreneurial skills to a better degree than would be the case back home, and also, of course, the chance to, to learn English uh, as well. Uh, many interviews also talked about the cultural aspects of living in London, both uh, the high culture and the kind of everyday multiculture of, uh, of, of London as such a, a cosmopolitan and super diverse 
city. And this was compared and contrasted with some aspects of you know, the boring, uh, sometimes racist and homophobic society uh, back home. But there was a, a sort of counter-narrative which came in here, which was for some people, um, uh, this contrast between London's uh, excessive cosmopolitanism, if you like, on the one hand, and uh, the yearning for the peace and quiet and nature of the home country, particularly maybe at a slightly later stage of these uh, young adults' lives when they were transiting to the later stage of, um, uh, of, uh, adult, of young adulthood. So, uh, yeah, here are some quotes which, uh, which illustrate the points um, that I've just made. Um, so, the middle one, what Latvia lacks is pleasant communication, discussion, constructive communication, sharing opinions of ideas. If you critique somebody, then that's seen as a, as, as, as a, as a problem. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, as time is short, I'll just, le I'll just le let you uh, read that set of quotes and this set also about other aspects of life. Uh, and here we're sort of getting to the, the, re the yearning to return and the third research question, which is about the future. Uh, after a certain number of years in London, people realise that actually uh, at a later stage in life, uh, when you might want to uh, sort of settle down, then maybe the home country offers a better environment for bringing up children than living in London because it's so cloudy, uh, so, so crowded, so... Um, uh, so expensive, uh, there's critiques about the school system which uh, resonate with one of the previous uh, uh, papers and so on. So here we're coming into the, the final research question, uh, the, the future, uh, where migrants were target migrants, in other words they came abroad in order to save up to buy a flat, or they came abroad to get a PhD or some particular qualification, then of course the, the return is, is kind of preordained or prefigured to some extent, but actually most of the interviewees had a very open-ended agenda and were extremely uh, ambiguous and ambivalent about what their future migration uh, intentions will be. Um, and this is a general problem with interviewing and talking to people at that young age, and we also find this with parallel interviews that uh, I have done with uh, Italians and Spanish uh, in the UK uh, as well. Uh, so there is some ambivalence about the future. They see that the career uh, development and professional fulfilment is obviously uh, best achieved in London, but if one thinks to the future uh, of uh, settling down and raising... Is that two? That's two, two yeah, thanks. Uh, raising a family, then clearly uh, the, uh, the better quality of at least the physical environment of home uh, is maybe uh, preferred. Uh, so here we have some of illustrations of that dilemma of trying to trade off uh, economic prospects um, on the one hand and career and the future of, of uh, sort of more mature adulthood uh, on, the, on the other. So just some conclusions there. Um, I think what we have found, um, if this is not being too kind of uh, optimistic or, or arrogant, um, is that our findings do match uh, quite well with some of the theoretical concepts that uh, I presented to you uh, very briefly. Um, there are these core periphery structures in, in Europe which seem to very much structure people's uh, migration behaviour and thoughts uh, about the future. They do achieve a considerable, in most cases, upward uh, socio-economic mobility through migration. And there is also a lifestyle story here as well. Young people, young graduates, uh, are keen to explore the lifestyle that is on offer in London. Uh, and for some that constitutes a permanent attraction, and for others it constitutes an attraction which just lasts for a number of years, and then another kind of lifestyle reasserts itself when they think about uh, the next stage <coughs> of their, their lives. Um, I said at the beginning that we were treating this as a, as a single sample. Um, we haven't yet had chance to explore uh, the comparative aspect, but overall there is much more similarity than differences between the three uh, groups of interviewees. Um, if we have any kind of intuition, it is that perhaps the Estonians seem a bit more return orientated than the other two groups. That may have to do with uh, the somewhat stronger socio-economic context of that country compared to Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, we also feel that there's some gender contrast which need uh, investigating. 
Uh, on the whole, we saw that uh, the more career oriented males were more orientated towards staying in, in London, uh, whereas the females perhaps were a bit more family oriented. I mean, both of developing their own families, but also feeling responsible uh, for caring for their elderly, perhaps their elderly parents uh, back home. Uh, but that's maybe too simplistic, too, too simplistic uh, uh, a gender divide. And uh, the final thing, which I think we would like to investigate are issues of uh, identity. How are these migrations shaping ongoing identities you know, as Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, uh, or feelings, feeling of, or developing feelings of becoming British, or more European, or indeed cosmopolitan? 